Hi, uh, welcome. <laughs> can I get, I want everybody to start uh, by doing this, uh, if you can help me out. Can you point out with uh, either your right or your left hand straight in front of you and, and form the straightest line you can? What, what, what you currently think is, is a straight line. Now, um, think, well, don't shout it out, but no, you're up is great too, That's, I like it. Um, what would happen if you were to follow your finger straight forward, if you just kept walking? Okay, so, I mean, don't do it because it'd be pandemonium right now. But if you did, you would, you know, say you walked over oceans and over mountains and through cities. I mean, you would try to go straight forward um, as far as you could. And what you thought was, by the way, put your hands down if you're getting tired. Uh, you would, you'd, you'd try and go in a straight line, but eventually um, you'd basically go all the way around the earth. Uh, you'd form a circle. You thought you were going in a straight line, but you'd form a circle. It's a pretty simple concept, but it's that shift in thinking that's the first piece of the puzzle that is understanding gravity. And uh, gravity is a weird thing, and uh, for a long time, Isaac Newton uh, modeled gravity as a force that pulled things down towards the Earth, um, as if a string that was, that was sort of tearing down on something. So if you can think of the example of a teacup uh, falling off a, t a table, um, you know, you take the table under from, out from underneath the teacup, the string is there to pull it down, and it smashes on the floor. But um, around the turn of the last century, Albert Einstein had a very different idea of what gravity was, and it involved this idea of a shape. He said the teacup doesn't have a force acting on it, but instead the teacup lives on a very complicated four-dimensional shape. So four dimensions is weird to think about. It's three dimensions in space and one dimension in time. He called it space-time. His, his equations are by, by no means easy, but um, they paint a really beautiful picture. And the reason is, instead of there being a force on the teacup, he said the teacup has only one mission, go as straight as you can. What's unfortunate for the teacup is that it lives in a curved universe. And what it wants to make a straight line with, but what it ends up doing is basically accelerating towards the floor. It's a four-dimensional straight line that it thinks it's straight, but really isn't when we look at it from far away. So um, the universe is, is very similar to that. It's, it's a very complicated shape that we live in. Um, and one way you can think about that shape is uh, as a stretched tarp. You want to you know sort of what this shape looks like. It looks kind of like this. You can think of it as a grid stretching in absolutely every direction. And where there are heavy objects on this grid, stars, planets, moons, um, they make indents. And you can think of orbits as, say, you took a marble and you flicked it on this tarp and it started to curve around whatever the indent was. That's sort of Einstein's model of gravity. We live in a complicated four-dimensional shape. Um, so you can ask now, uh, what would happen if instead of an indent, you made um, a pinch. It's, it's an allowable shape in his, in his theory of gravity, and uh, you know, this pinch is, is, is a complicated and weird thing because as you get closer to it, the, the curvature gets so great that at some point you can't get out of this pinch. You can't get out of this shape. There's a point at which it's just too great. So great, in fact, that light can't escape it. And that's why we call it a black hole. So this is what a black hole looks like mathematically. When black holes are formed, uh, one thing that can make this shape is when a star dies. So stars are really, really big, and they stay inflated because they're burning up a lot of gas. And that's how they stay that large. But at some point, the fuel runs out, and the star has to collapse. And it's a really, really heavy thing that can concentrate into a really, really small point in space. It doesn't happen very often, but one of the sort of retirement plans or ways for a star to die is a black hole. And a black hole sort of has two components. It has a singularity at its center, and then it has this thing called the event horizon around it. And the singularity is where all the mass lies. It's where all the former matter that made up the star is now resting in an, a, an infinitely dense point, and then there's this distance away from it, which we can label very clearly. I mean, it's a dotted line here, and there's a spaceship and stuff, but um, it's called the event horizon. And the reason we call it that is once you get closer than the event horizon, you can never go back out. You can't. That's, that's the point of no return. That's the point at which the black hole becomes black. That was, that was the theory of gravity. That was Einstein's ideas, and uh, they were around for a long time, and then another theory came out called uh, quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics is by far the weirdest thing. It describes the microscopic world. Um, it describes a world uh, where things are probabilistic events. Things are both happening and not happening at the same time. There's a lot of really strange things about it, but it explains some experiments really, really well. And one of the things that's allowable in quantum mechanics is something called vacuum fluctuations. And that's sort of what this picture is meant to describe. Yeah, that's the right one. Uh, a vacuum fluctuation is an event that can happen, and therefore over enough time and enough space it actually does happen, and it works like this. 
Are you, is anybody here familiar, by the way, with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle? Or is one person is, that's awesome, this is not relatable to it at all, but kind of similar. Uh, a vacuum fluctuation is this. You borrow energy from the universe out of nothingness. You borrow it for a very short amount of time. And then out of that energy, you create two particles. A particle and an antiparticle. One has positive energy, one has negative energy. And they fly apart for a very short time, and they fly back together, they annihilate into pure energy and they give it straight back to the universe. So you can see the net effect is nothing, right? We took, we took some energy out, we annihilated it, and we gave it right back to the universe. Really, we haven't you know, created something out of nothingness, but for a short time, we sort of borrowed something out of nothingness. And it, it's like popcorn happening all over the universe. They're just popping apart and popping back together. Everywhere. All around us, right now. And one place that this effect is happening is right outside the event horizon of a black hole. So what happens, you ask, when one of the particles flies out of the black hole, the particle flies out of the black hole and the antiparticle falls in? Well, um, I'm sure you're familiar with this equation. I mean, not familiar, but you know, you've seen it on a t-shirt or something. That's okay. <laughs> what this equation basically means is energy is related to mass. E is energy, M is mass, C is the speed of light, but it's just a constant in this case. And what it's telling us is that that particle of negative energy that entered the black hole gave the black hole negative energy, therefore gave it negative mass, therefore the black hole lost some mass. This giant celestial object that is really, really heavy and bending space-time is constantly losing mass and is constantly evaporating. This is thanks to a calculation uh, from uh, Stephen Hawking from 1974, I believe, so I want to give him credit, he's a famous guy. Uh, so the black holes are evaporating, why should we care? Well, there's one more piece to the puzzle. Uh, I'm going to call it the quantum detective. Because uh, we talked about vacuum fluctuations being a thing in quantum mechanics, there's another thing. And it's called reversibility. And for a long time this was debated whether or not this was a property of quantum mechanics, and over the past couple of years we've said, yeah, no, it probably definitely is, there's no way it can't be. And what reversibility is, is as if quantum mechanics was the perfect CSI team. They're, they're like the, the best forensic people on Earth. And every time they find a broken teacup on your floor, by the way, the reason I'm using broken teacups in this example is because every good thought experiment about gravity should always involve smashing precious china, just like as a base rule. Uh, so if they ever find the broken pieces of a teacup on the floor, they can calculate exactly how they broke, exactly how they fell, how they scratched the floor, how it affected the flow of air particles you know, around the room. They can reconstruct the whole thing and then play the laws of physics backwards and see the teacup reform itself and jump back onto the table. The equations work the same way forward in time as they do backwards in time. It's a really, really important property. And it's just true for quantum mechanics. So what happens then when this teacup falls into a black hole? Where is the information about it then? What, what frame of this film can you play backwards to recover uh, the idea that it was ever there? And what happens, even worse, if the black hole evaporates? It just disappears from the universe. Like, we really have no record. It's sort of allowable that we can throw the teacup in the black hole and then let it live inside, like we, we don't mind about that, but what happens when the black hole evaporates? It really erases information, and that's a big problem. And if you put all the pieces together, the sort of paradox that we've come to today is called the black hole information loss paradox. It's a really long name, but it's a paradox that's been around for about 35 years. And uh, it's, it's a beautiful thing to me because it's the paradox in, in theoretical physics that has highlighted this contradiction between general relativity and quantum mechanics for such a long time. And it's been over 35 years and we still haven't found sort of the missing piece to it. And you might ask in physics, well what happens when we have two pieces that don't fit together? Do we, do we quite, like if we do that on, a, you know, on homework or, or in work or just anywhere else in life, we say, well, that's a problem, where did I go wrong? Like who made the mistake? And for 35 years we've been thinking, uh, there isn't a mistake here. We're just missing a piece of the puzzle. And it's a, it's a, and you know, they're all happy now, it's great. But um, it's, it's such an interesting thing that this missing piece has, still hasn't been figured out. And you know what, I think as scientists, we don't care to completely figure it out. Like, we, we care that, that it exists, but it isn't the thing that excites the scientists the most. The thing I, I really want to tell you today is that the thing that excites the scientists the most, just like with pointing our fingers and trying to walk in a straight line, or just like we learned with reversibility in quantum mechanics, the thing that excites scientists the most is the opportunity to have your intuition broken. Thank you.